1979, Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require, require extraordinary evidence. And I would say extraordinary claims require not only extraordinary evidence, but extraordinary science. Uh, I was informed in the course of my official duties of a multi-decade uh, UAP crash retrieval and reverse engineering program. The U.S. Navy has finally acknowledged that videos appearing to show UFOs flying through the air are real. In closing, I would like to say that the Tic Tac object we engaged in 2004 was far superior to anything that we had on time, have today, or are looking to develop in the next 10 years. The Top aliens won't list. let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> you reveal all their secrets. <laughs> they, 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 they exercise strict control over us. They were always out there. You know, they were Always. out there when we took off, we'd see them, and then we'd go to land, they would still be out there. Like every day? Every day. Every day? Every day. The Navy's officially acknowledged that between 2004 and 2021, 11 near misses occurred involving UAPs that required pilot action and follow-up reports. Uh, we were primarily seeing dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere. I'm sorry, dark gray or black cubes? Yes, inside yeah. of a clear sphere, where the apex or tips of the cube were touching the inside of that sphere. The US government clearly knows what these are. At the very least, someone in the US government knows what these are for a fact. The witnesses will please stand and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Let the record show that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Remember the, uh, the camera adds 10 pounds. Uh, so how many cameras are actually on you? So the entire UFO conversation has been a point of ridicule uh, by the military, by the US government, and basically by the scientific community in general for decades now. Uh, ever since the flying saucer incidences in the 1940s, it has essentially been pointed at as basically the allure of only crackpots and sci-fi. You don't have a f***ing spaz attack. I do not have a spaz attack. No. So this was usually ridiculed by the government and even in a show I loved from the 90s, of course, was The X-Files. It was a guy who had been abducted as a kid that was seen as a crackpot by the rest of the government who would go and uncover these alleged incidences and figure out where the aliens were. But unbeknownst to most of the public, for a few decades at least, the government were actually taking this very seriously, although they were putting their own shall we say, flavor on it. The Air Force has recently made public Project Blue Book, an archive of UFO reports and investigations dating back to the 1940s. The report includes more than 12,000 sightings made by military members and civilians. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. Project Blue Book was officially opened in 1952. However, it was actually a carry-on report from Project Grudge and Project Sion, which kicked off in 1948. And in fact, Project Sion was originally Project Saucer, but it was renamed for obvious reasons. And these basically started from the outset of Kenneth Arnold seeing flying saucers, the Roswell incident, and so on. I kept looking for their tails, and they didn't have any tails. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I, something's wrong with my eyes. They seem to flip and flash in the sun just like a mirror. But the interesting part of Blue Book was essentially what it was set out to do. While they did take the investigations seriously, they were very much on a path, on a mission to try and debunk as many of these as possible or debunk them all. And one of the most famous debunking efforts was J. Allen Hynek, one of the scientists who was involved in debunking as many of these as possible, really upset the people of Michigan when he tried to tell them all, explain to them all that the lights and UFOs that all of these people in Michigan had seen was because of swamp gas. I don't understand why the people in Michigan got so excited over swamp lights. And sometimes this gas will gather into a ball and actually float away. And these people were rightly annoyed by that because 
Basically, he was being critical of their intelligence. And Heineck later on did say that he felt terrible about the entire situation and that basically it was his mission, his objective and his orders to debunk as many as possible and would have to go to these lengths for certain cases. And there was a good reason for the government to want to debunk these kind of cases. At the end of the day, in the 1950s, the US had very much gone full swing into a cold war with the USSR. And the problem that the government had in that situation was a fairly obvious one. It was that if there was some sort of national belief or concern that there was unidentified flying objects moving about in their airspace and not under the control of the Department of Defense, then obviously that could be used by Russian disinformation. They could essentially use that to cause mass hysteria. So it was in the government interest at the time, at the very least, to debunk this. Interestingly though, of about 12,000 cases that were looked at during that time, a lot of them couldn't be debunked. A lot of them couldn't be explained at all. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. However, in 1969, they decided once and for all to close Blue Book. And that was because basically they couldn't prove in the positive, or at least publicly, they said they couldn't prove in the positive that any of the three original questions could be answered in the affirmative. To break that down, they set out to answer three questions when opening Blue Book. And that was first off whether these objects in the sky were a danger to the national security of the US. And they essentially said that wasn't the case. And then they wanted to answer the question as to whether any of these objects posed a major advancement in technology that perhaps the US wouldn't have. So for example, if it was something that perhaps the Russians had that was way ahead of what the Americans had. And finally, there was the obvious question that was more the side of the public interest than anything else was, are these aliens? And they decided to close the investigation because basically they said there was no national security risk, there was no advanced technology, and there was no aliens. There was some interesting cases where it does cause you to become a bit of a conspiracy nut. For example, there were some Air Force pilots in, I believe, a B-52 who chased an object that they caught on radar and visually for quite some time before basically the object eluded them. And this was seen by Blue Book as to be probably Venus. Those sorts of things do make you laugh a little bit because you have to imagine that a qualified Air Force pilot would know the difference between Venus and a flying object, and more so that in my understanding of how radar works, I don't think they would have picked up Venus on radar, but you know, correct me if I'm wrong there. President Carter then asked for this to be reopened again in 1977 because he believed that these objects did pose some sort of national security threat or had some interesting technology that was declined. They said that they would just get the same answer. But obviously something has changed because we know now that those task forces, a task force at the very least, has been reopened again. And therefore, they must assume that one of those questions will be answered in the positive. As you know, my name is David Fravor. I'm a retired commander in the United States Navy. In 2004, I was a commanding officer of Strike Fighter Squadron 41, the world famous Black Aces. We were attached to Carrier Wing 11, stationed on board the USS Nimitz, and had begun a two-month workup cycle off the coast of California. On this day, we were scheduled for a 2v2 air-to-air -air training with the USS Princeton as our control. When we launched off Nimitz, my wingman was joining up. We were told that the training was going to be suspended and we were going to proceed with real-world tasking. As we proceeded to the west, the air controller was counting down the range to an object that we were going to, and we were unaware of what we were going to see when we arrived. There, uh, the controller told us that these objects uh, had been observed for over two weeks, coming down from over 80,000 feet rapidly descending to 20,000 feet, hanging out for hours, and then going straight back up. For those who don't realize, above 80,000 feet is space. So as we're looking around, we, we look to the right, and there's a, it's, it was, yesterday was a perfect example out here. The water is perfectly calm, no white caps. I mean, it's literally a perfect San Diego, California day. 
and we see white water, something like if you see a seamount, you know, rock underwater and then you're standing on the shore and the waves are breaking over and you're like, what is that? It's usually because there's a rock under the water. So it looks like that, but it's about the size of a 737. It actually kind of has a shape of like a cross and it's pointing to the east. So you've got the long part going east-west and you got a couple of things going north and south. All four of us, because we were in F-18 F, so we had pilots and Wizzo in the back seat. We look down and the, the Wizzo in the other airplane comes up and says, hey, Skipper, do you? And that's about what he gets out of his mouth. And I'm kind of looking at the same thing. I go, dude, do you see that? What is that thing? And what we see is this white tic-tac, tic-tac object with a longitudinal axis pointing north-south and moving very abruptly over the water. Radically moving forward, back, left, right at will. And it's moving around the disturbance the, the white water that we see. How big is this thing? So, uh, over time, it's about 40 feet long. There were no rotors, no rotor wash, or any sign of visible control surfaces like wings. And this thing's just going left. So the first thing you see when you look down, you go, and this is with our eyes, it's not sensors, right? So we're looking down at this thing, and first thing you think is helicopter, right? They're, they, they, the helicopters typically stay below 200 feet when we're out there, and they're just driving around. We're, we're pretty far away from the ship for a helicopter for one of ours. So what is it? So the first thing you look for is rotor wash. You know, if you've watched any TV show that starts kicking the water up, and you can see that it's really easy to see from the air. So we're like, no, oh, no rotor wash. As we started clockwise towards the object, my wizard and I decided to go down and take a closer look with the other aircraft staying in high cover to observe both us and the Tic Tac. So I'm like, okay. So I said, I'm gonna go check it out. That's what we're trained to do. The other pilot says, hey, I'm gonna stay up here. And I'm like, that's perfect. So now we'll, we'll get some separation. We'll get it from different views. And the other airplane, well, I kind of have a God's eye view of everything that's going on as I go down and check this thing out. We proceeded around the circle about 90 degrees from the start of our descent, and the object, ob- object suddenly shifted its longitudinal axis, aligned it with my aircraft, and began to climb. The tic-tac just kind of rapidly goes boop and turns, so now it's kind of pointing east-west, and now it mirrors us. So it's above the surface, we're up high, we're coming down, it starts coming up. I'm like, well, this is getting interesting. We went nose low to where the Tic Tac would have been. Our altitude at this point was about 15,000 feet, and the Tic Tac was about 12,000. So we kind of drive all the way around a circle. I'm descending, it's coming up, and I get over to about the 8 o'clock position of the, on the clock. And it's over at about the 2 o'clock position. Well, the quickest way, as we know as kids, to get someone, you know, you can keep going around the circle, nothing's going to happen. You cut across the circle. As we pulled nose onto the object within about a half a mile of it, and as I'm pulling up, it's kind of starting to cross my nose and it starts to accelerate. And within about less than a second, as I start to pull nose onto it and it crosses right in front of me, it just goes poof and it's gone. It rapidly accelerated in front of us and disappeared. Our wingmen, roughly 8,000 feet above us, lost contact also. So we, we don't see it, we're looking. At the same time, I say, hey, let's turn around and let's go back to see what was in the water. You know, there's, was there something there? So we turn around, we're right there. We haven't gone anywhere. It's gone. Water's perfectly, there's no white water, nothing, it's just blue. So as you started to turn back towards the east, the controller came up and said, sir, you're not gonna believe this, but that thing is at your cat point, roughly 60 miles away in less than a minute. And that was our original point where we were gonna hold 40 miles south of the ship. So this thing has went from wherever we were at to, you know, about 60 miles in, you know, maybe 30, 40 seconds, it's already over there. You can calculate the speed. We returned to Nimitz, we were taking off our gear, we were talking to one of my crews that was getting ready to launch, we mentioned it to them. So they launch off and we're telling them about this before and and, uh, the backseater, Chad says, he's really determined, he's gonna find this thing. So he tells the pilot, hey, we're gonna find this thing. And they went out and luckily got the video that you see, that 90 second video. What you don't see is the radar tape that was never released and we don't know where it's at, of the active jamming that the object put on an APG-73 radar. Weirdest thing, you know, my entire now flying career is defined by five minutes of chasing this white Tic Tac (laughs) vice, almost 4,000 hours. (laughs) I've talked to the guys, a couple of guys from the East Coast event, the gimbal video. Mm -hmm. My name is Ryan Fobbs Graves, and I'm a former F-18 pilot with a decade of service in the U.S. Navy, including two deployments in Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Inherent Resolve. I have experienced advanced UAP firsthand, and I'm here to voice the concerns of more than 30 commercial air crew and military veterans who have confided their similar encounters with me. And what year was it that you witnessed this? So we started seeing these in 2014 was the earliest that I know, 2013, late 2013, early 2014. After upgrades were made to our jet's radar systems, we began detecting unknown objects operating in our airspace. At first, we assumed they were radar errors. 
But soon, we began to correlate the radar tracks with multiple onboard sensors, including infrared systems, and eventually through visual ID. But we would only see them over the water, so they would really only be in our working areas. During a training mission in Warning Area Whiskey 72, 10 miles off the coast of Virginia Beach, two F-18 Super Hornets were split by a UAP. Um, he flew, he turned around, flew back, landed, and uh, I was in the ready room when he came come back. And, you know, he had all his gear on, which typically is not a good thing because uh, you want to get that stuff off as fast as possible. So usually means, you know, there's a problem of some nature. The object, described as a dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere, came within 50 feet of the lead aircraft and was estimated to be 5 to 15 feet in diameter. And how long would these things stay up there for? So from my experience, from our experience, and again, we weren't studying these, but they were always out there. Mr. Moultrie, as the chairman uh, mentioned, uh, DOD had an initiative to study UFOs in the 1960s called Project Blue Book. It's also been well reported in our briefing and in, in other places that we have more, have more recent projects, specifically uh, ATIP. Could you describe any other initiatives that the DOD or DOD contractors have managed after Project Blue Book ended and prior to ATIP beginning? Did anything also predate Project Blue Book? So I, I, I can't speak to what may have predated uh, Project Blue Book. I mean, of course, there's Roswell and all these other things that people have talked about over the years. Um, I'm familiar with Blue Book. I'm familiar with, uh, with ATIP. Uh, I haven't seen other documented uh, studies that have been done by DOD in that regard. So you're not aware of anything in between Project Blue Book and ATIP? Not aware of anything that's uh, official that was done in between those two. Okay. Hasn't been uh, brought to my attention. Okay. What is shocking to us is that the incident was never investigated, none of my crew were ever questioned, tapes were never taken, and after a couple days it turned into a great story with friends. It wasn't until 2009 until Jay Stratton had contacted me to investigate. Unbeknownst to all, he was part of the ATIP program in the Pentagon led by Lou Elizondo. In essence, I had some, I guess, some prerequisite experience that they were looking for. At the time, the, the organization was fairly, fairly new, and they were looking for someone to create a counterintelligence and security portfolio. And I guess because of some of my background running investigations, uh, counterintelligence investigations, and some of my background in, uh, in technology protection, specifically with aerospace systems, that probably, I suspect, was was a fairly lucrative skill set that they were looking for to to create this this sub portfolio under ATIP, um, and that's how I got into the program. It, I, I, I entered the program in 2008. I was asked by its director to come on board and and establish this program, and then in 2010 is when I I was asked to take over the effort. My name is David Charles Grush. I was an intelligence officer for 14 years, in the, both in the U.S. Air Force, uh, both active duty Air National Guard and Reserve, at the rank of major, and most recently from 2021 to 2025, or excuse me, 2023, uh, at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I was my agency's co-lead in unidentified anomalous phenomena and transmedium object analysis, uh, as well as reporting to the UAP task force, UAPTF, uh, and eventually, once it was established, uh, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Arrow. So for close to two decades now, the U.S. government has had a variety of UFO, or what they're now calling UAP investigation, task forces reopened. So initially, the Air Force and the DOD at the closing of Blue Book said they would only reopen such a task force if one of those three questions was likely going to be answered in the positive. So which question was answered? Or at least which question do they believe they can now answer in the positive? I mean, do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and, and those locations were provided to the Inspector General. Um, this is for any one of you. Based, on, based off of each of your experiences and observations, do you believe UAPs pose a potential threat to our national security? Yes, and here's why. The, the technology that we faced was far superior than anything that we had, and you could put that anywhere. If you, if you had one, you captured one, you reverse engineered it, you got it to work, you're talking something that can go into space, go someplace, drop down in a matter of seconds, do whatever it wants, and leave, and there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing. 
If everyone could see the sensor and video data I witnessed, our national conversation would change. I urge us to put aside stigma and address the security and safety issue this topic represents. If UAP are foreign drones, it is an urgent national security problem. From my experience, from our experience, and again, we weren't studying these, but they were always out there. You know, they always. were out there when we took off, we'd see them, and then we go to land, they would still be out there. Like every day? Every day. So he picks up a hit on his radar and he goes to lock it up because I've watched all the tapes. He goes to lock it up and immediately the radar can tell it gets signals back that it's being jammed. So, and technically jamming is an act of war. First question is, uh, there have been no collisions between any U.S. assets and one of these UAPs, correct? We have not had a collision. We've had at least 11 near misses, though. Maybe we'll talk about those 11 near misses or any place where there's close proximity. Um, I assume, or tell me if I'm wrong, there's been no uh, attempt, there's no communications uh, or any kind of uh, communication signals that emanate from those objects uh, that we've detected, correct? That, that's correct. And have we attempted to communicate with those objects? Uh, no. My first question is, um, you've identified these as taking place on the East Coast. Is it just on the East Coast where these encounters uh, have been reported? No. Since uh, the events initially occurred, I've learned that the objects have been detected essentially where uh, all operations, uh, Navy operations are being conducted across the world. Uh, and that's from uh, the All Domain Anomaly Resolutions Office reporting. The bottom uh, map is a heat map of all reporting areas across the globe that we have available to us. Um, there are emerging capabilities out there that, that in many instances, Russia and China, well, China in particular, are on par or ahead of us in some areas. So any intrusions that may compromise the security of our operations by revealing our capabilities, our tactics, techniques, or procedures uh, are of great concern uh, to the Navy and the Department of Defense. From the very beginning, we took these reports very seriously. You had referenced uh, specific treaties between governments. Article 3 of the Nuclear Arms Treaty with Russia identifies UAPs. It specifically mentions yep. them. Uh, yeah, you're referring to actual uh, public treaty in the UN register. Um, it's funny you mentioned that. Yeah, the agreement on measures to reduce the risk of outbreak of nuclear war signed in 1971. Well, that's when they would keep an eye on us. You know, uh, when they dropped Fat Man and Little Boy on Jap uh, Japan, mm. that's when UFO sightings started happening all over the globe. Oh. Uh, yes, that is that is one of the concerns we have from a national security perspective, that there does seem to be some sort of congruency or some sort of intersection between these UAP or UFO sightings and our nuclear technology, whether it's nuclear propulsion, nuclear power and generation or, or nuclear weapon systems. Furthermore, those same observations have been seen overseas in other countries. They too have had the same incidents. So that tells us this is a global issue. Now in this country, we've had incidents where these UAPs have interfered and actually brought offline our nuclear capabilities. And I think to some, they would probably say, well, that's a sign that, that whatever this is, 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 is something that is peaceful. But in the same context, we also have data suggesting that in other countries, these things have interfered with their nuclear technology and actually turned them on, put them online. So that is equally, uh, for me, just as concerning. It's also been reported uh, that there have been UAP observed uh, and interacting with and flying over sensitive military facilities, particularly, and not just ranges, but uh, some facilities housing our strategic nuclear forces. Uh, that data is not uh, within the holdings of the UAP task force. Um, can you please explain to me in detail the event that occurred at Vandenberg Air Force Base? Certainly. Uh, in the 2003 time frame, uh, a large group of Boeing contractors were operating near one of the launch facilities at Vandenberg Air Force Base when they observed a very large 100-yard sided uh, red square uh, approach the base from the ocean and hover at low altitude over one of the launch facilities. Um, this object remained for about 45 seconds or so before darting off over the mountains. Um, there was a similar event within 24 hours later in the evening. Uh, this was a morning event, uh, I believe 8.45 in the morning. Later in the evening, post-sunset, 
there were uh, reports of other sightings on base, uh, including some aggressive behaviors. Uh, these objects were approaching some of the security guards at rapid speeds uh, before darting off. Uh, and this is information that was received through one of the uh, witnesses that have approached me at Americans for Safe Aerospace. Was this documented in any official form, whether it was a police blotter? Yes, they had uh, official documentation and records from the event that the witness uh, held over the years. So if these things were ultra or extraterrestrials, let's say, and they were around before 1947, I'm a little bit skeptical of the idea that they only showed up after the first nuclear bomb was dropped. There is a lot of evidence around that, and obviously the timing seems to be accurate from 1947 onwards, but there were World War II fighter plane pilots who said they saw Foo Fighters, you know, fireballs in the sky, unexplained phenomena during World War II, that was in Blue Book. And on top of that, the other side of it is that realistically we only got power of flight in 1909. So you wouldn't have seen many people up in the sky to see these things. And also if people saw stuff on the ground, the reporting wasn't there. And think of it simply, we only started flying at night during World War II. So I think it was a situation of if these things were around, we perhaps weren't at vantage points to see them and people just weren't looking for them. And if they saw them, perhaps they just weren't reporting them in a way. So it is an interesting idea, an interesting theory, but I'm a little bit skeptical of it because I think that if there is a case where these things weren't around before that, I think it's because of underreporting and the fact that we didn't see these things more so than they just arrived when we had nuclear capabilities. Because at the end of the day, like I said, there was reporting from the pilots in Blue Book from before that time. So yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical of that, but it is an interesting theory. Have our encounters with UAPs altered the development of our, either our offense or offensive or defensive capabilities or even our sensor capabilities? It would take that for the closed session. Okay, great, thank you. Is there any indication that these UAPs could be uh, essentially uh, collecting reconnaissance information, Mr. Graves? Yes. Mr. Grush? Fair assessment, yeah. Mr. That's Fravor? Very possible. Again, in the national security vein, uh, is it possible that these UAPs would be probing our capabilities? Yes or no, Mr. Graves? Yes. Grush? Yes. Fravor? Definitely. Is it possible that these UAPs are testing for vulnerabilities in our current systems? Yes. Yes. Possible. Do you feel, based off of your experience and the information that you've been privy to, that these UAP, U, uh, UAPs uh, provide uh, an existential threat to the national security of the United States? Mr. Graves? Potentially. Yes, sir, potentially. Uh, same answer, potentially. Yeah, say Fravor. definitely, potentially. Mr. Graves and Fravor, you know, in the event that your encounters had become hostile, would you, have, would, have, would you have had the capability to defend yourself, your crew, your aircraft? Absolutely not. Sir? No. Is based off of the information that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs are interested in our nuclear technology and capabilities? Yes. Uh, by external observation, sure, that could be a fair assessment, yeah. Yes. UAP are in our airspace, but they are grossly underreported. These sightings are not rare or isolated, they are routine. Military aircrew and commercial pilots, trained observers whose lives depend on accurate identification, are frequently witnessing these phenomena. Okay, so if these things are not US assets, then they are clearly a national security risk. You could hear from those pilots that clearly these things were invading airspace where they shouldn't be. It's in the reports by Arrow that Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick talked about, that these things are flying in airspace around Navy assets that are worth billions. And at the end of the day, if these aren't US assets, then they're able to show up and do whatever they want and are able to evade the capabilities of normal pilots. On top of that, they have caused 11 near misses. And Ryan Graves talked about the fact that these things came within 50 feet of a pilot who was clearly quite annoyed about the entire thing. And at the end of the day, if that was a jet with a Chinese or Russian flag on it, you can be damn sure that would be an international incident. So. This is definitely a national security risk. I think though what is more alluring about all of this is the next question. Have these got advanced technology? Because that's where it gets really interesting. 
Are there common characteristics to the UAPs that have been cited by different pilots? And can you describe what the convergence of descriptions is? Certainly. Uh, we were primarily seeing dark gray or black cubes inside of a clear sphere. I'm sorry, dark gray or black cubes? Yes, inside yeah. of a clear sphere, where the apex or tips of the cube were touching the inside of that sphere. And that was primarily what was being reported when we were able to gain a visual tally of these objects. And that occurred over almost eight years. And as far as I know, it's still occurring. I don't want to draw too many firm statements like that because we would see them being flat too. We'd see them perfectly stationary up there, uh, regardless of the wind. Uh, really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. So what kind of wind are you talking about? Oh, gosh. I mean, at altitude, you can have anywhere up to 100, 120 knots of airspeed. Which is, what is that in miles per hour? It's about 100, 130, 140 miles an So hour. they're completely stationary with 140 mile an hour wind. Correct. So it's almost like it's the wind. It's not even really fighting the wind, it seems. You know, it just seems like it's, it's just there in a way. UAP appear to demonstrate advanced technology. Uh, those 18 uh, incidents... Uh, in which uh, some of the UAP appear to remain stationary, winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. I think I would, uh, without discernible means of propulsion, I would say that uh, we're not aware of any adversary that can move an object without discernible means of propulsion. What, what astonished you the most about the, the flight capabilities of these Tic Tac, very briefly? Uh, the performance absolute performance it was and, and uh, you're you're not aware of any other objects that anybody in the world has in this world that has those capabilities no i think it's far beyond actually our material science that we currently possess we have nothing that can stop in midair and go the other direction nor do we have anything that can like in our situation come down from space hang out for three hours and go back went from they tracked it going from eighty thousand feet above sea level to 50 in less than a second they have no idea how it moved there's no visible propulsion system. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong way to report it. What you okay. say is, we have sensors uh -huh. that told us this is what happened. I understand what you're saying. Okay? Yes. That's a very important distinction. When we were first experiencing these objects off the eastern seaboard in the 2014 to 2015 time period, anyone that had upgraded their radar systems were seeing these objects. I wanted just to follow up on the filters for surveillance. Um, outside observers have speculated that DOD sets filters on certain sensors to eliminate objects that are moving really fast or slow because what we are looking for militarily are conventional aircraft and missiles. So we get all the raw, for example, radar data prior to the scrubbing and filtering to allow it to enter into our weapon systems and our detection systems. We are now taking all that data and cross-correlating it to what pilots are saying they're seeing or other observations from other operators. So I found the filters conversation when I was doing research for this documentary really interesting because Basically, what's been admitted here is that there are filters on these radars, on these visuals and so on that these Navy pilots are seeing. And I guess that should have been obvious from the start. But I think it's interesting in that if you were to go down the conspiracy route, it obviously does open up the possibility that perhaps because everything would be so segmented if the government knew about these UFOs and UA or UAPs, that perhaps a different supplier of a new upgraded radar wouldn't have the filter set up in a certain way and therefore they would start seeing these things. But if you do go down that route then, basically what it opens up the possibility of is that these things that Ryan Graves and the Navy have now admitted are out there on the East Coast all the time could have been there for the last three or four decades and they could have been watching everything going on for a century, for decades. It could be Russian assets that were out there since the Cold War that were kept heavily secret, for example, if you wanted to go down that route. And that it's only because these filters have now been removed or accidentally haven't been put in place on these upgraded radars or that these upgraded radars can just see these things that we are now getting so many reports that they exist. But the, the filters conversation is, it, is really interesting because it does open up the possibility that I hadn't considered that they could be strategically hiding US assets uh, if that is technology that the US actually has. That filters would be the perfect way to hide that 
and that a simple accident, a new radar, has caused that to all become unraveled. It's an interesting one. The question then becomes, in many of these cases where we don't have a discernible mean of propulsion in the data that we have, um, in some cases, uh, um, there is likely sensor artifacts uh, that, uh, that, that may be hiding some of that. Uh, there's certainly some degree of, uh, of something that looks like signature management that we have seen from some of these uh, uh, UAP. This, this cup has a radius of r and a circumference of 2 pi r. The disk that it spans is pi r squared in area. But if you look at this cup, it's much larger than pi r squared because we pushed it out. Hmm. You could have a sphere where if you could cheaply engineer space-time, not through the Einstein field equations, but through the successor theory that recovers Einstein, you could have an entire stadium inside of a tennis ball. Just the way this cup doesn't blow your mind until you realize that its area is much greater than pi r squared. You could, why look for a giant floating thing in the sky? If you could bend space and time, and you could play with the rulers the way I'm saying, I would put this in a tiny little profile. So let's assume for a moment that all of this data is correct, that it's not some sort of strange upset in a sensor, it's not some weird filters that are misbehaving, it's, it's not some strange data or something we can't explain is causing errors in our sensors, in our cameras and so on. Let's just assume, and I know it's a big assumption, that the sensor data, the visual data, and all of this data of these UFOs or UAPs, as they call them now, are correct. That all of that is realistic, and that these things are able to just hop around, disappear, you know, jump from place to place, fly from 7,200 miles an hour, for example, stop dead, turn, and go back the other way, accelerate instantly. Let's imagine all of that is accurate for a moment. If that is the case, then this technology is incredible. And whoever is working on this is working on something that is so far ahead of what we think we have technologically. It must be mind blowing if there is someone who knows that this exists to kind of try and explain that. Or imagine a person reverse engineering this because this technology is so far beyond what we think we have. I mean, an F-22 will do 1,500 miles an hour, but it can't stop on a dime and turn. You know, we have got planes, us as a species have got planes that will do over 3,600 miles an hour. But again, they can't stop and do a 90 degree turn. So this technology would be bonkers find patents from the U.S. military that claim to revolutionize propulsion tech using like anti-gravity spacecraft, like really out there, wild, weird, theoretical tech. It means a craft that uses highly pressurized mercury accelerated by nuclear energy. So the plasma is produced, which in turn creates a field of anti-gravity around the craft. Anti-gravity technology dates back to the latter part and aftermath of World War II, and specifically the covert US project known as Operation Paperclip. So the question then, I guess, becomes if these things are out there, they do exist, the technology is there, the big question then becomes could we have developed them? And by we, I'm talking, you know, the, the big we, we as a species, we as the human race, not we as the US government, the Chinese government, the Russian government, the Irish government, which is unlikely. Could we have developed them as a species? Because that for me is a bigger question than could we keep that development secret? Because, you know, there's a lot of talk around the idea that, for example, if it is the US government, it would leak and we'd know about it. The, the irony of that is, well, we technically do know about it because we're getting reports of them flying around and we've got people talking about us developing them as a species. But honestly, the question around could we keep these things, could the US government, for example, keep these things a secret? I think they could because, well, they've done it before. To be fair to, to the other side, um, you know, if you read about the development of the U-2 spy plane and the AR-71 Blackbird, you know, this was done in Burbank, mm -hmm. where you, yeah, near sure. where you used to live. And that's right in the heart of LA. How did they yep. do this for all those years and nobody knew about it, right? 
So then the bigger question for me is not could we keep it a secret, because I think we as a species could. The bigger question is could we have developed to that point on our own? Because at the end of the day, we did only start controlled manned powered flight in 1909. There had been flying objects, if you want, that we had created as a species before then, but the Wright brothers were the first ones to actually power and control a flight for a short amount of time. And if you look at that as 1909, 114 years have now passed, and in that 114 years, the technology has been booming. I mean, at the end of the day, we've gone from man-powered flight of, I think it was 100 meters or something, maybe less, to being able to circumnavigate the globe. You know, you can hop on a plane now and go anywhere in the world within hours. Uh, we have the Concorde, you could fly from New York to Dublin or to London in three hours. We've got internet, we are able to communicate with anyone in the world instantly. We have artificial intelligence. So, you know, we've, we've technologically come an incredibly long way to a point where, you know, like I said, you can communicate instantly. You're watching this documentary probably on a television or computer that I just uploaded into the air. So the technology has come a long way, but the leap between, you know, the internet and being able to fly anywhere in a couple of hours to being able to manipulate gravity to a point where essentially time and space and distance becomes irrelevant. Could we have developed that on our own in the last hundred years? That for me is the question. It's not whether, you know, the government can keep these quiet, whether these are aliens or not. Well, I guess that is part of the same question, but could we have developed them as a species in the last, let's say 40 years? That's the big question for me. That is, that is the real question. Mr. Gresh, finally, do you believe that our government is in possession of UAPs? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and, and those locations were provided to the Inspector General and some of which to the Intelligence Committees. I actually had the people with the first-hand knowledge um, provide a protected disclosure to the Inspector General. You've said that the U.S. In has intact space spacecraft. You said that the government has alien bodies or alien species. Have you seen, have you, have you seen the spacecraft? I have to be careful to describe what I've seen uh, firsthand and not in this environment, but I, I could answer that question behind, behind closed doors. This, these aircraft, um, ha have they been identified that they are being produced by, by domestic um, you know, military and, um, contractors? Is there any evidence that that's what's being recovered? Uh, not to my knowledge, plus the recoveries predate a lot of our advanced programs that I previously am witting of, so. Are you aware of any individuals that are participating in reverse engineering programs for non-terrestrial craft? Personally, yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, the problem is that when you go down the rabbit hole of asking, could we have developed these, you will inevitably wind up with someone by the name of Bob Lazar. And I think it would be unfair uh, not to, at the very least, give a brief overview of the Bob Lazar story. Because look, at the end of the day, uh, there is the question that you will always inevitably get, which is, you know, if they are reverse engineering craft, how come nobody has talked about this? But in reality, a couple of people have. But when you hear talk of like crashed retrieval programs, uh, if there was a crash retrieval and reverse engineering program like David Gresh talked about and had been in existence for decades, somebody would have fucking opened their yap and talked about it. I think I Other that's, than Bob Lazar. Other than Bob Lazar. Tonight in part five of his report, George Knapp introduces us to a local man with an amazing and uh, disturbing story. George. Gary and Mary Ruth, uh, we've been working on this story for a long time. And we'll tell you right up front that it's going to be hard to swallow at first. Well, they're trying to make me a non-person. Hey, explain. You called where? Well, the schools that I went to, the hospital that I was born at, uh, past job, and uh, essentially nothing comes up with my name in it. And Los Alamos put it on the front page of the paper. 
1982 clipping from the Los Alamos newspaper profiled Lazar and his interest in jet cars. It, too, mentioned his employment at the lab as a physicist. You used to work at Area 51. And Area 51... Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. The fact that secretive things go on here is a given, even to the Soviets, who make daily spy flights over the facility to take a peek at what's going on. Area 51 is where Francis Gary Powers and the other U-2 pilots were trained in the 50s. The SR-71 spy planes that spotted Soviet missiles in Cuba in the early 60s were also developed at 51. 51 is where stealth technology was nurtured. God, you you went like, huh? Well, you know, we want to be accurate. Area S4. It's a very interesting building. It's got a slope of probably about 30 degrees, uh, which are hangar doors. And it has textured paint on it, but it looks like sand. It's made to look like the side of the mountain that it's in, whether it's to disguise it from satellite photographs or what. The speculation first surfaced in documents obtained by UFO researchers, documents about something called Project Aquarius. The documents allegedly prepared for an organization called MJ-12 state that a program to fly recovered alien spacecraft was established in 1972 and is continuing in Nevada. And did they give you any sort of job description of what you were applying for? Um, they said it was for... Ad- I can't remember exactly what they did. This was a long time ago, but I, I think it was um, advanced propulsion or something like that. The power source is an antimatter reactor. Uh, they run gravity amplifiers. There's actually two parts to the drive mechanism. Uh, it's just, it's a bizarre technology. There's no physical hookup between any of the systems in there. Uh, they use gravity as a wave using waveguides, almost like microwave. Now you said there's nine of them and you got a brief glimpse at the other ones. Were they, how are they different? Oh, they looked completely different. One looked like a, I called a jello mold and it, it looked like a classic jello mold with the rippled sides to it. One was a very flat disc. Um, that was sitting up on its edge, and the thin part of it had it looked like a projectile had been fired through um, the edge of it. So I don't know if they were attempting to, to see if the metal could be penetrated, or if something, or if that's where the thing came from. Maybe it was shot down. Um, but that was the only one where I saw there was, you know, actual physical damage to it. I'm a little skeptical about his claims. I have to say, um, a friend of mine claims to know the the gal who was his supervisor when he worked out there and knows what he was was actually doing and where he was located um and claims that uh that he was a guy who checked radiation on badges that's it yeah and so uh, all the rest is fiction so the discrediting for me is interesting because It's weird that the government would go to such lengths to discredit someone. For example, with David Grush, they basically made sure from everything it sounds like that his medical records and his struggle, his suicidal tendencies during the time that he was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder were made public. They basically made sure they came out. And that would obviously be to discredit him. But it's interesting that they would do that because if they just basically said, Uh, this is all nonsense, I think that would be a better way to tap down all of this than what they did. Because the simple logical problem with that for me is, okay, you come out and say, well, this guy's clearly a loon. I mean, look at this, he was suicidal, he had a drinking problem at this time. But the same people who will bring that up are the people who checked his clearance and hired him and put him in this position in the first place. So the question is, is he a loon? and you screwed up your entire classification process and we have bigger issues here or is he accurate and you're trying to hide something so that's a bit weird the bob lazar one i think is harder to kind of figure out because they said he didn't work in los alamos fairly sure he did they said he didn't go to mit you know that is by the by the bigger one was basically that for decades He didn't work in Area 51 at all. And then Chris Mellon, who says he's skeptical about the entire Bob Lazar story, admits that he thinks he worked at Area 51. He just didn't work on this. So it's just, it's odd to me that you would discredit someone in that way because obviously the easier solution is to just do what you've done for decades. 
not bring up any sort of discrediting and just say, ah, look, you're always going to get these loons when it comes to that community and just laugh it off and say, we've no comment on it. That, that seems like an easier way to deal with this. Discrediting someone this hard, like they did to Bob Lazar and like they did to David Grush, that does make me wonder more whether they're hiding something. But I am, I am still skeptical that there is, you know, nine or 12 UFOs sitting in the desert somewhere that no one seems to be able to uncover. That, I'm still skeptical that that is the situation. I made the decision based on the data I collected to report this information to my superior, superiors and multiple inspectors general, and in effect becoming a whistleblower. As you know, I've suffered retaliation for my decision, uh, but I am hopeful that my actions will ultimately lead uh, to a positive outcome of uh, increased transparency. I guess the question has been answered as to whether these things could be potentially a national security risk. I think the answer to that is very much they could be. Have they got advanced technology? Yes, if this technology exists and is real, it's, it's mind-boggling to be honest. But the question as to whether they're aliens throws us into realistically the ultimate question here. Because I think we can say with utmost confidence that these things do exist. You know, there's enough sensor data, visual data and so on to say that there is something there uh, and there's something pretty advanced technologically there. The real question then is source. Where does it come from? Uh, the bottom line is up, up until very recently, there are really only, only three possibilities of what this could be. And the first possibility is that it is some sort of secret US tech that somehow uh, we have managed to keep secret even from ourselves for, for a long period of time. So the first and most obvious question is, is this US military hardware that has been developed in utmost secrecy and kept from not only the US people, but also the globe, the human race? I think the, the honest truth is I've already answered the question, essentially, could this be developed in secret? Because, well, I can't. And at the end of the day, if the US has this technology, there is the argument that how does nobody know about this? How does nobody talk about this? And at the end of the day, we, we have had people talk about this. They have seen it flying. Um, so this could very well be a top secret US craft. And then the question is, if it is US military hardware, would they test it near to other US military hardware? But in your experience as a pilot, does our government typically test advanced weapon systems right next to multi-million dollar jets without informing our pilots? No, we have test ranges for that. So what those pilots have said, well, I would take as fairly accurate. I think it would be a fair assessment that normally the US wouldn't test this amongst other military hardware for a variety of reasons you know, including not wanting to damage their aircraft. We've heard about the 11 near misses. Uh, and just on top of that, not wanting to give away any secrets, you know, have any problems and so on. It, it just makes sense. But at the same time, if they did start developing these in the 50s and 60s, and they unlocked some crazy potential that they've kept secret, they will eventually have to test them outside of ranges. Maybe what Bob Lazar said was accurate. Maybe they were developing this technology in secret and maybe they were all told it was alien technology because obviously if Bob Lazar then runs and tells everyone it's alien technology, the rest of us snivel and laugh. Maybe what he was working on is something that they started developing after World War II and that's why they had a variety of different units. They had developed some sort of biological-like creature to fly these things or some sort of robot, you know, like it is all possible. It sounds like sci-fi, but we could have developed these things. And in that case, as they develop and build more and more and more of them, obviously they're going to use them for reconnaissance. Um, and obviously they're going to use them to go and do some crazy things. However, the intelligence community and the people investigating this have said for a fact that this is not ours, as in US, obviously not Irish, not ours as in not US technology. I won't ask you in this setting, obviously, uh, to describe any secret DOD programs. That said, I do want to make sure the US government isn't chasing its own tail. Um, firstly, do you have a clear and repeatable process 
to check with compartmented programs about whether a UAP sighting is attributable to a U.S. aircraft. Uh, secondly, do, uh, does the AIMSOG staff have the clearances and read-ons that they need to investigate all of these incidents? And, 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 and thirdly, when your staff cannot be read on, uh, are your questions to those who are read on even being answered? So I'll start and then uh, I'll, I'll pass that to, uh, to Mr. Bray. So we're very conscious of the potential blue on blue issue or U.S. on U.S. And so we've established relationships with organizations and entities that, um, that are uh, potentially uh, flying or developing platforms for their own interests, if you will. And our goal is to continue. And we have a repeatable process. I think we've had that process for some time to deconflict uh, activities that we may have to ensure that we are not potentially reporting on something that may be a developmental platform or a U.S. operational platform that is performing uh, either testing or performing a mission. So we will have that uh, in place. We've already had those discussions with organizations and entities. We want to uh, ensure that we're protecting their equities. We want to ensure that we're protecting their sources and methods while also getting at what we have here. We want to be able to deconflict those. Absolutely. The UAP task force has uh, uh, had a, a process in place to work uh, with other elements of the Department of Defense and other elements of the government to ensure that, uh, that, that there is an uh, as simple a way as possible to deconflict those. And when we reference that in the uh, in the report, uh, I should say that we were um, simply accounting for the fact that there could possibly be one or two uh, data points that had uh, that had leaked through, but we were quite confident that was not the explanation. Now, as of this week, we now know through some of the discussions at senior level leadership that uh, this this report has definitively stated once and for all, that's not our technology. Uh, and that's that's hugely important. For 30 years, there has always been this undercurrent, if you will, these conspiracies that there was some sort of TR3B program and some sort of, yeah. uh, of super special technology that has been implemented and we've been uh, just been very careless about it. So obviously they're adamant that it isn't US tech and that a variety of people have checked and there is no technology that we know of that is being developed or has been developed by the US, it's not ours, blah, blah, blah. You, you hear it all, all of it, all of it. I'm still a little bit skeptical about that because during Project Blue Book, for example, they talked about the fact that they knew for a fact it wasn't our own tech. And a lot of the cases in Project Blue Book talked about flying wings and many of those flying wings were labeled as unexplained. Uh, that they couldn't figure out what those flying wings were. But we know for a fact now that Northrop and uh, you know a lot of other technological advances at the time, and even during the 40s, they were building flying wings. The Nazis had worked on flying wings. So the government very well knew that if there was a flying wing over Nevada, California, over basically the western side of America, that there was a good chance that it was Northrop or the US military testing a flying wing design. So that's why I'm not 100% sold on the idea that it's not US tech, because at the end of the day, even if the highest clearance person in the military was to tell me this isn't ours, I would still say, okay, but do you know that for a fact? Are you just saying that first of all, or is the tech that is out there something that even you don't know about? Is it above top secret, which apparently isn't a thing, but is a thing? The second option is that it's some sort of foreign adversarial technology that has somehow managed to technologically leapfrog ahead of our country, uh, despite having a, a fairly robust and comprehensive in, in intelligence apparatus. We had an announcement by former director of national intelligence, uh, Ratcliffe, who said this isn't Russian technology. And as we know, during Glasnost and the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was this five year romance period, if you will, between the United States and Russia, where we began really sharing a lot of information. And a lot of their, ironically enough, a lot of their UFO information wound up in our hands. So that really leaves China. And if you look at the, that from a, from, a, from a temporal perspective, from a time perspective, it simply doesn't make sense that China back in 1950 would have this beyond next generation technology, mastered it, 
is able to fly it at will anywhere it wants on the face of the planet. And the last 70 years, despite the billions of dollars we put into our intelligence community infrastructure and architecture, uh, it, has, it has managed to evade us. There is the other option, the, <laughs> the crazy far out option that this was Nazi technology. And that is a little bit more plausible because realistically they did start working on anti-gravity technology or the idea of anti-gravity technology during you know the Nazi regime. It was something we know they looked into. It was something that we know they brought over to Operation Paperclip when the Americans basically hired a load of former Nazi scientists. Could it be something in Europe, something that the British got their hands on maybe? Um, could it be something that is now US tech but brought from foreign technology that perhaps was lost by the Russians during World War II that the Nazis had and so on. That to me would be a more logical option than Russia or China. So personally, I don't think it's Russia or China. I think that would be very, very, very unlikely. And that if you think it's Russia or China, I think the more obvious answer would be that it's, it's, it's American tech. And of course, the, the third option is, is something quite entirely different. It's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. You've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? It's something I can't discuss in public setting. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries, yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness like how would that be determined the specific documentation i would have to talk to you in a skiff about so that's the the biggest question is if the american government didn't develop this from scratch then is it alien technology or in fact is it you know something that bob lazar talked about is it a derivative of alien technology you know, is it reverse engineered alien technology? Regardless of whether you want to say it's alien or it's US tech that has been reverse engineered, they both kind of stem from the same idea. Is this alien technology? And honestly, you know, when I started researching for this documentary, I was, and in fairness, I am still 98% sure that this was just some sort of US secret program. However, the core to that US secret program being alien, or at least some of this being alien, has swayed me to that kind of 2% mark. And the reason for that is, the more I think about that, the more I consider that it could be alien, the more I think to myself, we have so many unknowns that it very well could be. At the end of the day, when I was born in 1989, there was no internet. By the time I turned 15, we had phones in our pockets and I was able to communicate with basically anyone in the world who had a phone wirelessly, not even landline and I could basically access all of the global documents in the world that weren't classified. And now that I'm 30, I can now record this video in a small studio and publish it out to millions of people. Now, probably only 50 of them will watch, but that's beside the point. The point here is the advancement of technology has shown us that there are so many things that we don't know. And even with satellites in space, plans to go to Mars and so on, we still don't know much about even the deep sea, let alone space itself. And if you were to take a motorbike and put that motorbike back in the 15th century, that would be magic. That would be alien to anyone who lived in the 15th century. 
So I guess what I'm saying is I couldn't write off the fact that this is alien technology or even ultra terrestrial technology, something that has been on our planet but hidden away for centuries or whatever. Can I write that off? No. My argument against this in the past would have been, I think that it's statistically probable that there are aliens, but that it's statistically unlikely because of the distances that they have visited us. But now that we are talking about the kind of technology that we're seeing in these cases, gravity technology, that would mean that you could basically make distance more or less irrelevant. It would kind of allow you to bend light and get to the point where you could travel faster than light speed. So could it be aliens? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the most likely option in my head still is that it's some sort of US tech, but could it be aliens? Sure. The reverse engineering thing is more interesting to me now, because if it is reverse engineered technology, does something with that type of technology manage to make it the whole way from light years away to our planet and then crash? I would have thought that's an unreasonable statement, but while researching this, that was somewhat answered for me in a way that is logical. The concept that an alien species that's technologically advanced enough to travel billions of light years gets here and somehow is incompetent enough to not survive Earth or crashes is, is something that I find a little bit far-fetched. I will give you a, uh, a theoretical framework at least to work off to kind of espouse uh, crashes, uh, regardless of uh, you know, your level of sentience, right? You know, planes crash, cars crash. N number of sorties, what, however high, a small percentage are going to end in, you know, mission failure, if you will, as we say in the, in the Air Force. I guess the simple fact is that while I think that it is likely US tech, could this be some sort of hidden reverse engineering program? Sure. At the end of the day, the comeback that I would have had and that I've heard multiple people have to that is if there was reverse engineering programs going on inside the US government, somebody would have talked about it, can now be answered by the fact that, well, they have. And it's no longer just Bob Lazar. It's now someone fairly credible. But even if we forget about that, even if we forget about where this thing comes from, if we forget about reverse engineering, and we forget about all of those conversations. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is really interesting that now, right now, we are at a time where three very credible people are willing to sit in front of Congress under oath and say to the world, there is something up there and we've seen it. And we're not quite sure what it is. And that very credible argument and credible statement is by itself absolutely incredible. And this is for all three of y'all, starting with Mr. Graves. Why did you come forward on this issue? I came forward because I felt that my colleagues did not have a way to mitigate the safety threat and I wanted to help them. I was trained as an aviation safety officer by the Navy and this seemed, it just, it just felt right. I felt like I had to help the folks that were still flying and dealing with this. Mr. Grush. Uh, purely a sense of duty. Um, I first swore an oath when I was a cadet 18 years ago and I, I still uphold that even out of the uniform. Commander. I was pestered uh, by a friend. <laughs> And I asked why, and he said, you're the one person that they can't discredit, and you'll add credibility to the New York Times article. And so after about six times, I said, okay. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. 